Breaking news. The next generation of Sony's cameras have leaked. I have all that information for you. The A5, the A9 Mark III, the A7R5, a new totally different camera called the A3. I'm gonna tell you about it, but first a word from our sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace makes the best websites you've ever seen. Anyone can set them up regardless of your technical skill level. Take your photography or any type of business to the next level by creating a real web presence with your own domain, your own set of email addresses, your own store, book sessions with clients, and your reliance on social media now by going to squarespace.com slash Tony. Try it out for free, no credit card required, and when you love it, use the coupon code Tony and you'll get 10% off. First off, some of these are based on rumors from Sony Alpha Rumors, but for the most part, I am putting these together based on my own experience working with Sony and working in product management myself in my previous lives. I wanna answer a couple of frequently asked questions. First up, why are all the new cameras so expensive? The last half of this year has been filled with hype for the Canon R3 and the Nikon Z9, both of which are well north of $5,000. Meanwhile, just about everybody I talk to wants a camera, wants to spend like 500 bucks. The reason that they're so expensive is that 2021 is an absolute year of turmoil for shipping products, but especially all types of electronics. Of course, you've heard of the chip shortage where chip manufacturers simply cannot keep up with the demand, but there's also a shipping problem. There's shipping containers filled with toys out in the middle of the ocean that can't dock, that can't be unloaded, partially because of a severe labor shortage problem especially in the United States, but largely around the world too. This means that manufacturers can't make the toys that you want and you might not be able to buy them even if they could make them. And if you have a limited amount of production available, you're gonna focus your priorities on the highest profit items. So I think that's a big part of why everything is so expensive. There's another factor too, of course, big expensive smartphones are killing the bottom and the entry level of the camera industry. And indeed, in our own tests, comparing real cameras to smartphones, smartphones win now in most situations, especially for casual photographers. So most people no longer need to buy a camera except those who are serious. And those serious people tend to pick the higher end cameras. I hope this changes soon as cameras become more friendly, hopefully, and chips and shipping problems are resolved. The next most frequently asked question we get is, why haven't you reviewed the Canon R3 or the Nikon Z9? Do you hate them? Are you under some sort of exclusive agreement with Sony? No, we have requested loaner copies of these cameras from both these manufacturers repeatedly. For whatever reason, I'm not a mind reader, they do not want us to review these cameras. But that will not stop us from reviewing these cameras. Of course, maybe they'll get one to us before they actually ship to consumers. But if not, we've pre-ordered them or we will rent them, but we'll get them soon. I urge you to wait until we get a chance to really scrutinize these cameras because there is a reason they didn't want us to get them. It's not that our channel is too small. We get hundreds of thousands of views just covering the specs of these cameras. We just hit 1.5 million subscribers. So many of you rely on us for honest reviews, but we happen to be the biggest channel that is heavily into sports and wildlife photography. And as a result, we tend to scrutinize things like frames per second and focusing systems more thoroughly than other reviewers do. We tend to find problems in those systems that other people miss. We also own those big expensive 600 millimeter F4 lenses for all three systems, Canon, Nikon, Sony, and we use them continuously. And that's gonna put way more pressure on those new systems than anything else. So those are some possible reasons. I don't know, maybe you know another reason why they wouldn't want to loan us these cameras. I'd be happy to hear about it in the comments. Before we get into the specs of the new cameras, I want to talk about Sony's lineup and how it now compares against Canon and Nikon because there are some glaring omissions. First, in the entry-level segment, Sony has the A7C at $1,800, but Canon has the RP at $999, often more like $900, and Nikon has the Z5 at $1,200. That's a huge gap for Sony. Sony has nothing in this low-end full-frame market except the very old and terrible Sony a7 II. I've never recommended this camera. It is inexpensive, it has fine image quality, but the usability, the battery life, it's, it's garbage. It does not have a touch screen. Come on, focus your piece of shit. 
Did you just call that a piece of shit? Yeah, just because it's a piece of shit. I hated that camera when it was new, and I hate it now, and I wouldn't recommend it to you. They need something more modern for the low-end segment. So I'm gonna give you two answers for that. Sony just launched the a7 IV, which is targeted towards serious enthusiasts and professional wedding and portrait photographers, and it's just a great general purpose camera that is closely matched with the Canon R6, though they have some key differences, and both those cameras really surpass the existing Nikon Z6 Mark II, primarily in its autofocusing capabilities in the high-res section. This section includes the Sony a7R4 with 60 megapixels, the Canon R5 with 50 megapixels, and the Z7 Mark II at 42 megapixels. In our tests, the Z7 Mark II really lags behind the other cameras in things like frames per second real world, as well as autofocus tracking with telephoto lenses. It's not as good of a general purpose camera. The a7 IV really lags behind the R5 though. This is the way that Sony is actually behind. R5 was our camera of the year. It shoots 20 frames per second. It has an amazing autofocus system, even with our 600 millimeter F4. That's why Chelsea chose it for her main wildlife body and indeed her multi-purpose body for video and everything. Sony does not have a competitor and I think they're gonna introduce one. A7 IV is great. I have one personally. It's great for landscapes, but it doesn't have a flip screen. It has the old user interface. The autofocus system is not up to the task of big 600 millimeter lenses. So it's time for an update for that. And in the sports section, Sony actually currently owns this. So we don't expect to see too much movement from them. They have the Sony Alpha 1 at 30 frames per second and 50 megapixels. That's 30 frames per second raw, something the Nikon Z9 cannot do. It's limited to 20 frames per second raw. R3 does 30 frames per second, but it has a much lower megapixel count. Keep in mind, the A1 was launched in January, almost a year ago, and actually shipped in March. So it's almost a full year ahead of the Canon and Nikon competitors, which still don't match its specs, at least. Sony actually has two separate mirrorless pro sports body, the other one being the same Sony A9 Mark II, and that one, I think, is going to get an update that I'll tell you about in a second. But first, a camera that actually competes more with the DSLRs like the Nikon D500 and the Canon 90D. I predict this is going to be called the Sony A1000, and I've mentioned this camera before. A fast, high-megapixel baby A1 with an APS-C sensor that would be perfect for APS-C enthusiasts, but also wildlife photographers who want that extra crop, who want that extra pixel density. It would come in less expensive than the A1 at about $3,000, but it would offer a higher pixel density with a 33 megapixel sensor. This is very similar to what the Canon 90D does now, and indeed, it's a fantastic camera for wildlife. I think it'll match the A1's specs by shooting at 30 frames per second with a fast readout. That means a fast viewfinder, low lag, and minimal rolling shutter. I also think they'll just take a full frame body, probably the A1 body, and put the APS-C sensor in it. $3,000, it's a lot to spend on an APS-C camera. It's gonna be a very niche camera, but for wildlife and sports photographers, that niche is really important. I also think, unlike their other APS-C cameras, it'll have dual memory card slots. Now, the A7R Mark V, the successor to the Mark IV, which was a high megapixel, mostly landscape and portrait camera, good for product photography, but it was never a sports or wildlife camera. Along comes the Canon R5, which is actually great for sports and wildlife, and Sony doesn't have a competitor for it, and the R5 has been selling like crazy. It is incredibly popular because indeed, it's an absolutely amazing camera. Sony is not gonna let Canon keep the spotlight for long. I think they'll keep the same 60 megapixel sensor, but they'll up the frame rate. They certainly want to match Canon's 20 frames per second with the electronic shutter. So I predict they'll do that. And while they're at it, they'll update the entire software system. So it'll have the new menus that the A7S Mark III and the Sony A7 IV have. Again, they need to at least keep parity with the R5, so I think they're gonna offer 8K at 30 frames per second and 4K 120 frames per second video. I also think that they're gonna want to surpass the R5 in some way, but I haven't quite figured out what it is. I've debated this a lot, whether it would have a tilt screen or a flip screen. I love the R5 with the flip screen because it's one camera that can do everything. In the Sony world now, if I want a high megapixel camera, I have to pick a tilt screen camera, which means I have to travel with my Sony A1 tilt screen for stills, and then my Sony A7S III with a flip screen for video. I think Sony's gonna match that. 
make a camera for hybrid shooters and give it a flip screen. Oh, I just realized, here's how it'll beat the R5. It'll record 8K at 30 frames per second for a longer period of time, like maybe an hour or something with no restrictions, something the R5 has been highly criticized for. Now, today, Sony announced that they have a new partnership with Gannett and USA Today. Basically, this organization has about 500 news photographers that are going to gradually switch over to Sony cameras. They're not throwing out all their old, probably Canon cameras now, but when they go to purchase new cameras to replace those existing cameras, they're, they've agreed to only buy Sony cameras. And of course, the reasons that they give are that Sony's technology is better, they have the best infrastructure. These are all valid reasons. At the same time, Gana and USA Today, they're not YouTubers who need to make a video every three weeks, oh, I just switched to Sony. They don't need to announce that they're going to, in the future, buy a different brand of camera, right? They could just go to Amazon and order themselves up some and just be quiet about it. They did this because they have a bigger partnership. And I don't know what that looks like. And it's actually really hard to anticipate because Sony is one of the biggest corporations in the world. They have spread out horizontally across the media industry. They make movies and music and music videos and TV shows, they make video games. They are so big that the scope, the realm of their negotiations is almost unlimited. There's certainly so many different ways they could have come to this agreement with Gannett and USA Today. And there was something beyond just the camera technology. These negotiations can be complex. That brings me to a camera that's perfect for sports photographers and photojournalists, the upcoming Sony A9 Mark III. Of course, Sony's gonna update the Sony A9 II, a camera that didn't really make much of a splash because it wasn't a huge upgrade. And I don't expect this to be anything earth shattering. I think it'll keep the same 24 megapixel sensor, but I think it'll have a faster readout speed, more similar to the A1, and they'll definitely raise it to 30 frames per second to compete with the Canon R3. However, I think they might also want to compete with the, the Nikon Z9. So they might give lower quality images at a higher frames per second. So maybe they'll do 30 frames per second raw, and then um, 120 frames per second JPEG, maybe even in 12 megapixels or something lower. Sony does not like Canon or Nikon to have the fastest or the highest numbers in any particular spec. So I know they're not gonna wait long before they answer. It'll definitely get the new menus. It'll have a tilt screen, not a flippy screen because Sony thinks that that's what professionals want. I think this camera is gonna be priced about $5,000, substantially under the higher megapixel A1. Now let's get into the entry level cameras that I know most of you will actually buy. I mentioned Sony doesn't have an RP competitor, a Nikon Z5 competitor. So I think they're gonna give us the Sony A5 with 24 megapixels, five frames per second, a flippy screen, 4K video, but probably cropped like the Nikon Z5 just to reduce the amount of cannibalization with their higher end cameras. They'll have a single memory card slot and I think it'll be priced about $1,200, right about where the Z5 is now. This is so important because right now, entry level for Sony is either super old cameras or APS-C cameras, but it's really important to get them into the full frame system because once they're full frame, they're more likely to spend more money on other full frame lenses. Here's a Henry Ford quote. If I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Now, how does this relate to Sony's new cameras? Well, every time Sony revs a new camera, I think they talk to existing owners and they say, what would make you want to upgrade? What they don't do is they don't talk to my 17 year old daughter who is constantly taking photos and videos and wants better quality, but does everything with her smartphone. They don't say, what would make you be willing to spend money on a separate device to get better images? Indeed, they don't talk to any young people or any existing smartphone creators. They only ask old folks like us who are shooting with interchangeable lens cameras now. And that's why every new camera looks just like the old camera, but with some numbers increased slightly, right? But if they were to talk to this younger generation, they might realize how much capital there is in the partnership that they currently have between Sony's smartphone and camera divisions. Recently, these two groups were moved within a single division, and indeed, we've seen them working more closely together. We recently reviewed the amazing Sony Xperia Pro i smartphone, and it has a lot of the Sony Alpha camera touches moved over into it, and a full one-inch sensor it doesn't fully utilize it, but it does have that full real camera sensor integrated into it. That's what happens when the Sony Xperia smartphone group borrows technology from the Sony Imaging Camera Group. But 
what if we were to turn the tables? What if the camera group borrowed the Android smartphone technology from the smartphone group and built a truly smart camera specifically targeted at first-time camera buyers, existing smartphone creators. I'm gonna call this the Sony A3. It runs Android. It has a 12 megapixel sensor, just like pretty much every smartphone does now, but it's full frame, so it can take all those great interchangeable lenses. It shoots at five frames per second, because these creators don't care. They're shooting stills, yes, for things like portraits, but they don't need high megapixels or high frames per second for that. It'll, of course, have a flippy screen because so many of these creators are filming themselves. I think it'll do 4K at 60 frames per second. That's a high spec for a low-end camera, but that is something that just about every single smartphone has now. And being that it's just a 12 megapixel sensor, it's not going to take a lot of computing power because there's no need to scale anything down. It can just do a one-to-one -one readout. Otherwise, it'll largely resemble Xperia smartphones from the software perspective. It'll have physical controls, dials and buttons, just like a real camera but the software itself will essentially be a smartphone working as a layer on top of conventional camera technology. That means the memory can be internal. No need to actually swap out memory cards. There won't be any. It'll probably have 128 gigs internal, very fast memory that can be instantly backed up to the cloud, just like every modern smartphone can. Of course, it'll have GPS and a cellular connection, so all your photos will be tagged on a map. And if it's ever lost, there will be important anti-theft technology. Yes, that means you'll be able to track down your camera if it's stolen. The thief will not be able to access your images because the device will automatically lock itself, which means if you just got back from photographing this new season's fashion and it's highly confidential, they won't leak it for you. If you just did a boudoir shoot, those private images aren't gonna be leaked and you or the client aren't gonna be extorted for them. I think this new Sony a7 III is gonna come in at $999 dollars i think it's going to be a loss leader to get new creators into the sony system sony desperately wants these vloggers and sony this is how you do it now if those anti-theft technologies sounded good to you well good news camera manufacturers might be able to give you some of those with a firmware update there's an active petition with about 5,000 signatures at the moment that you can sign to tell manufacturers that you want some security features added to your cameras, your existing cameras or the next generation cameras. Head to this link and sign the petition right now. In the comments down below, I'd like to hear what you think of my predictions. Am I on target or am I completely off base? Would you buy any of these cameras and what do you want to see from Sony next? Don't forget to visit our sponsor, squarespace.com Tony to set up an amazing website. Absolutely free trial to see if you like it or not and I promise you're going to like it. I personally have four or five Squarespace websites because whenever I have a new project come up, I will create a website for it on Squarespace so it has its own home on the web that I don't have to worry about maintaining because the Squarespace geniuses just take care of that for you. They make it super easy, just try it out. Squarespace.com slash Tony, coupon code Tony if you like it. Thank you, Squarespace.